The attack to take down the rest of the planet begins in earnest as the Colubra ships advance on all sides. From the poles to the equator, the ships slingshot around the planet. Those stationed behind the moons move as well, tightening the noose around the human fleet stationed on the far side of the planet. As soon as any Colubra ships gets within range, they fire all torpedo tubes. The torpedoes wrap around the planet ahead of the ships. This may seem like an early warning, but it's more akin to a pre-invasion bombardment. The moment a Columbra ship gets close enough to get line of sight, they begin to fire their ballistic main guns. Using the planet's gravity well, the ballistic shots are fired blind to disrupt the human formations and maybe, just maybe, get a lucky hit. As soon as they get true line of sight to the human ships, they begin to engage with every possible weapon system at their disposal. This didn't matter if it was main guns, tertiaries, torpedoes, fighters, it didn't matter. With ships coming in on all vectors around the planet and the Clumber fleets that were hiding behind the moons blocking their escape, the humans realize they're surrounded, outnumbered, and outgunned. Being the case, the choice was simple. We're surrounded? Good. We can attack in any direction. And that is exactly what they did. The human's fleet formation excelled in every single direction at once. From the surface, it looked like the universe's slowest fireworks as things began to explode. The Columba were surprised, but didn't stop. The fight against quality and quantity was beginning to shift as human ships are coming under increasingly heavy fire and as they scramble and jockey for position the last of the drone swarm is launched with a simple order kill them all as the human ships are being to reach point blank range with the enemy they pull their ace out of their sleeves on the surface two seemingly buildings begin to move as they rotated and seemingly lean over, it was clear that these are not buildings. But each of these are massive coil guns loaded with projectiles that fire at Mach 12, more than enough to break free of the planet's gravity well. The first shot fires up and pierces clean through an enemy destroyer, while another one glances the side of a battleship. The glance shot didn't take it down, even though it was firing a 500mm rounded spear. Spike, this was enough to rip most of the port side clean off, causing it to be nothing more than a twisted hulk as almost the entire ship began to depressurize. Being so large, it takes nearly eight minutes to reload the gun safely. Within that time, the Columba realized the danger and began to launch fighter craft to the surface. With the Columba ground forces unable to reach the massive cannons to take them out, and the fact that the ships capable of orbital bombardment are just far too busy at the moment, the only option they have left is an airstrike. Thousands of aerospace fighters are sent and streak through the atmosphere, and anyone who looked up to the sky would look at these and see... Nothing but burning rain as so many were coming down so close. The fighter pilots believed that this would be a simple mission, a milk run. Drop in, destroy the cannons, take out a few targets of opportunity, and leave and go home heroes. They found out very quickly why the young admiral didn't use them before. As the corona of heat dissipated from around the fighters, every warning started sounding inside the cockpit. If it wasn't sounding, it was flashing, and the pilots started looking around to see what was going on. They found out very quick that ground-based missile systems were streaking up to meet them. The pilots employed their countermeasures, but were only 50% successful at best. The smartest pilots would employ their countermeasures and still shoot at anything coming at them, this vastly increased their survivability as they passed through the web of missiles. Many did not notice the missiles suddenly coming in from their flanks. The outer ends of the fighter formation turned into burning rain once again as these strikes came in. And before any of them even realized, the human atmospheric fighters were punching their fighters completely full of holes. 
The humans used their stealth tick to its full effect as they could easily outmaneuver the extremely heavy aerospace fighters due to all the extra components needed to operate in and outside of an atmosphere. The Kalumbra fighters were about as nimble as a Su-25, something that can be easily outmaneuvered by an A-10. Once the human aircraft got within gun range, it was over before you even realized you'd been hit. This would be called the Great Jameson Turkey Shoot, as was able to destroy all but four Kalumbra fighters before they could fire on the massive direct incursion coil cannon. Since the Kalumbra couldn't cause enough damage, the DICC, also known as the Dick, just kept penetrating enemy hulls. Back up in space, the Kalumbra were stuck in offensive operations while still needed to take an excessive amount of evasive maneuvers just to keep them from taking a Dick to the face. They still had the advantage of putting the humans in a kill zone, and they were going to take full advantage of this. Watching another ship fall to his cruiser's impressive firepower, the young admiral knew that victory was within his coils. There is just no way the humans left in this sector can fight their way out of this, he thought to himself. And then, once the space is clear, he would turn his attention to ending the threat of those ground-based cannons. With the sheer numbers of the ground forces circling around the planet at this point, along with the heavy weapons, armor that was on the ground, they wouldn't even need their ships. And the planet will fall, he told himself. As the number of human ships continued to dwindle, the Calubra gunners were having a little difficulty striking a particular human corvette. In fact, the gunners began to place bets on who would take it down first. As it was perfectly clear that his crew was taking enjoyment of this, in fact, it was palpable throughout the ship, he could see that they had all but achieved victory in space. That is when warnings began to blare, and all he heard from his officers were, Incoming ships! Snapping back to the holographic display, the young admiral looked and he saw as a new group of human ships were arriving, many are designs he had never seen before. The largest have strange dual-mounted turrets, and they seem to be spinning on all possible sides. Realizing that these were human reinforcements, the young admiral tells all the ships to continue to engage at will, knowing that all ships, whether it be Columba or human, must go through a cool-down phase before they can do anything. He was not going to let the opportunity to take out several of their ships go away. The Columbra immediately turned as the captain of the battleship Saratoga called on his radio to the rest of the human fleet. Sorry we're late, but we did bring some party favors. Behind the human ships that are already jumped in, even more seemed to jump in. These massive, bulbous ships seemed to not care about joining their brethren, though. Instead, all four of them headed towards the planet immediately. The smaller craft with these large ships made sure to keep themselves between the large Bulva ships and the Columbra, though the Columbra were a little busy at the moment. The Columbra didn't have time to care as they began to fire everything, torpedoes, main guns, turreted guns, particle lasers. The humans responded, though, in kind. As the Columbra particle lasers struck out into the human fleet, the frigates known as DAFs began to spin up and ran at full cyclic rates across the enemy formation. The human destroyers and battleships launch a horrifyingly high amount of torpedoes, seeming to be reloading faster than even the Columbra's best ship. And then the Columbra were surprised as the human battleships began to fire. With each shot, another Columbra ship was turned into nothing but a floating tomb. The young admiral was happy to see hits on the human fleet, but he also saw hits on his own forces as they were getting systematically slaughtered. Taking a breath and slamming his tail on the deck, he screamed, All ships withdraw! The crew paused and looked confused for a moment, and then suddenly the ship jumped from one side for a near torpedo strike. Tell the entire fleet to withdraw! Into Kulber space, now!
he screamed. As the ships maneuvered away, the XO asked the young admiral, What about our warriors on the planet? Just then, the ship lurched to one side as one of the human main gun rounds had just grazed the side of the ship. The young admiral stated, We can't help them if we're dead! The humans on the other side watched as the Columbra fleet began to disengage. The Columbra never stopped firing, but now as they were trying to run for it, this was more out of desperation than anything else. The young admiral's cruiser jumped away while venting atmosphere from several hits, and others followed suit. As a final insult, a shot from the ground from one of the dicks was able to stop a Calubra battleship from jumping as it struck a perfect shot penetrating its aft section and going right out through the bridge. While this was going on, before the Columbra even began to withdraw, the four carriers began their mission. The human carriers, these big, bulbous ships, are designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to invade planets. The invasion carriers are a very niche vessel, and they are not required for space warfare at all. Instead, they bring exactly what's needed to take a planet. Minus the orbital fire support, of course. For the general and all those going to take the planet, they didn't like orbital fire support much at all. I mean, why would you actively try to destroy a planet you're trying to take. As each carrier gets into position, the dance of deployment began. With the Columbra spread out across such a wide area on the planet, the carriers worked mainly by themselves. As the carrier maneuvered above its target, the ventral section seemed to open up to show an entire side that seemed to be nothing more than launch tubes. Without wasting time, once these tubes were open, everyone was launched. In rapid succession, the tubes launched the pods down towards the surface. Each pod carries four personnel with their gear and their weapons that they carry, and a single transport. This transport could vary from a hover vehicle, four-wheel vehicle, tracked vehicle, or, if you could swing it, four small two-wheeled vehicle, each one with a loadout specific to their mission. Along with the vehicles, each member of personnel was outfitted with a full exosuit. Every single one of these exosuits was outfitted with additional weapons on board, most of which complemented them. This could be anything from a ballistic weapon to some sort of explosive. Many of these are affixed to the arms or to the back, but many of them are automated as every single one of the troopers requires to be cyberjacked to make sure the exosuits work correctly. Though even with this, there was always a nasty surprise in addition on the pods, just to make sure everyone could get out of the pods so they can do what they do best. Strike first, strike hard, and have absolutely no mercy for any Xeno that gets in their way. As the pods are being launched out to the ventral sector, the port and starboard sides of the ship seem to open up, as it seems to be a simple wall of doors and hatches that open, and hastily craft begin to spill out. These craft are used to bring down the heavy weapon systems along with additional personnel. Though their primary mission is transport, they're all still loaded for bear. Once the transports have all cleared the carriers, the entire ship rotates and the dorsal section is now facing the planet. Just as before, a fury of pods is launched towards the surface. This brings the number of drop troopers up from 10,000 to 20,000 ah, 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 of angry, bloodthirsty murder machines heading down towards the planet at extremely high rates. On the way down, it's normal to see a mass of pods and shuttles heading down towards the surface at the same time. Each had their own part to play in the invasion, and they all played it well. The first pods would always strike first, as they're going down much, much faster than any shuttle can keep up with. They land on top of the enemy lines. These troopers are set up with extremely heavy armor, and they will be taking hits almost instantly. 
They have to move quick and make a good landing zone because the shuttles will be down four minutes after they make planet fall. The shuttles, when they begin to land, release even more personnel and bring even bigger weapons. If the LZ isn't clear yet, the pilots will do it themselves with the large amount of guns they carry, missiles, rockets, and even using their fusion engines if need be. While they and the frontline troopers are making an unholy mess of things, the second wave lands. The second wave of pods lands behind the enemy lines, as these troopers need to be more mobile. Their armor is much lighter. Yet, when they begin to leave their pods, each pod releases 36 kamikaze drones, 9 per side. These drones will lock on to enemy equipment and personnel and cause havoc, allowing a second wave of troopers to simply evaluate the area and advance onto their target. The second wave troopers have two jobs in particular, stopping resupply from the front lines and pushing into the enemy's backside, though they do have to be careful not to push too hard as they do not want to create any crossfire with their own people, because friendly fire just isn't friendly. This, of course, causes mass confusion in the enemy lines, and at this point, the enemy will have no choice to become a stationary target, and this, this leaves them to be the perfect target for heavy weapons, in particular artillery. That is only time humans halt and then pull back, because when you call artillery, everybody knows. You only call artillery if you want to kill everything. But wait, there's more! The support ships that came in next to the carriers have a purpose beyond just fire support for the carriers. Once the second wave is on the ground, they immediately begin their landing sequence. Ships that large take a very long time to lower themselves onto the planet's surface, mainly because they cannot use their fusion engines to land in a combat zone. Reason being, it's far too high of a risk of burning up your own men on the way down. Since they're moving so slow, once they get to the gravity well, they begin to deploy an updated version of an old weapon system. This is a massive number of open metal crates that deploy parachutes. These chutes are not exactly designed to slow it down, but more to keep it facing a certain direction. As they're heading towards the surface, they deploy a multitude of decoys, and right behind it, high-yield explosive munitions on what used to be called glide bombs. Since they're up so high, they have a range of somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 miles. Their primary mission is to take out communications and any anti-air units and facilities. Since these are deployed long before they reach any type of dense air, the support ships have to wait until they reach a dense enough atmosphere before they can continue with phase two. Unfortunately, this drives many of the pilots crazy as the variability of the density of air quality in any planet can be extremely variable. However, once they reach the dense air, that is when they really get to shine. They immediately begin to deploy atmospheric fighter aircraft. The multi-role stealth-rigged VTOL fixed-wing aircraft get dropped out of ramps from the ventral side of the ship. There's no need for a catapult in this case, just gravity as they roll their way off and then simply bank their way over to whatever their target is. And they want a piece of the action before those on the ground take all the good targets. With everyone focused on their part of the battle, only one group has free range to move across all the phase lines without any question. This last unit emerges from the support ships and kind of look like a Chinook. Just a little bit wider and no propellers to keep it aloft. Using a standard repulsor tech, they don't move as fast but are extremely stable and they arrive wherever they are called. Many of their pilots are considered the craziest motherfuckers as they will fly their giant pickle straight through enemy fire to get the wounded. Looking rather silly, these ships actually look like angels for those that need them. 
By the time the medics have picked up their first group of wounded and got them on that giant pickle they fly into, the support ships have already made planetfall. Once on the ground, they deploy a couple automated turrets, but these are primarily for defense. What they do is begin to open all hatches and doors and transform the ship into a mobile base, though these flying bricks are not grandiose in any way. They are extremely efficient. With these support ships on the ground, it allows the entire line to get resupply, refit, repair, and acts as a mobile army surgical hospital. The shuttles from the carrier themselves, once they return from their initial drop, begin to resupply these support ships and, of course, the front line if called, as if they would need it. From the Columba perspective, they had so many forces on the planet that they had covered nearly half of the planet itself. Their front line was wrapping around the planet the same way the ships had done, and they now had the additional heavy weapons and vehicles that were brought in before the ships assaulted in space. With the human fleet too busy to worry about the surface, the only big issue were now the human cities. These, of course, would be bombarded once the rest of the planet was taken. The Columbra looked and saw that the front was progressing smoothly until large pieces of metal came crashing down under a strange canopy made of fabric. These metal teardrops are heavy enough to crush almost anything that they land on. Before the Columbra realized what the hell just happened, they hear an explosion and a multi-directional metal ball cannon seems to explode. The ball bearings begin to perforate buildings, foliage, and of course, flesh. The forces are forced to take cover from this strange assault. Many of them only pause for a minute before they raise their heads again to see what the hell just happened. As they do, the area is covered in a thick white smoke. Within the smoke, they can see something is moving, but they don't know what it is. It is like something is lowering, and then something else is moving. They couldn't tell, as it's mainly concealed by the smoke. In complete shock, they see as massive metal bipeds walk out of the smoke, holding projectile weapons, energy weapon, and seem to even have weapons coming out of them. Before the Columba can react, the shooting begins. These lumbering bipeds put out an enormous amount of fire, along with putting out fire with plasma weapons that seem to burn everything they touch, and of course, the multitude of explosions that seem to come out of them, all while moving away from the pods so that the vehicle inside can make its appearance. Spinning up, many of the multi-barreled weapons on these vehicles seem to just not stop spitting death across the battlefield. The Columba particle cannons are marginally effective against these heavily armored bipeds. A glancing shot won't do anything, but several direct shots might actually slow it down or take it. They found out quick that the melee weapons actually work, but so do these bipeds. They tend to pull out a glowing heated blade that extends from one of the arms, sometimes both, and will cut through all weapons armor, and of course, personnel. Many times, they would simply take off limbs, or a full tail. The majority of times, though, the Columbra would watch as one of their brethren is cut horizontally, or worse yet, vertically. With all this happening, shuttles arrive, spinning out even more fire and more pipeheads that run or drop out of it. These new humans as they realized, are much lighter and armored and even armed. But with these strange jump packs, they are far more maneuverable than ever before. It is even difficult to hit them with their projection cannons. Even in some areas where the Columbras are able to get the battle line to stabilize, it isn't long before they find out that another group of humans are shooting them in the back. Though lightly armored compared to the first ones they hit, they are just as deadly as they bring in their own vehicles, their own ballistics, their own explosions, and of course, their own blades. 
the Columbra would look, and these seemed to be coming from their quote-unquote friendly side, and at that point they realized that no support is coming. With no place to slither off to, all the Columbra can do is hold their position. This is about the time they saw thousands of aircraft and drones fly overhead. The guided bombs are first, but they didn't know that's what it was. Looking in the distance, the Columbra could see their support units, the ones that were supposed to come and help them out, get them out of this situation, and they were just exploding in dozens of massive explosions along the horizons. That was right before the fixed-winged atmospheric fighters ripped across the sky, some of them seeming to want to get very, very close. A few would come in just a few meters off the ground and shake the ground as they went by. Sometimes the wind was strong enough to pull a Columbra clean out of their hole and pull them into the air, and it seemed like they would whip around following the path of the wind, yet they couldn't do anything about it, but as they floated in the air and whipped around, they were simply perforated by all the ballistic fire. Even with this, the Columbra started to wonder why the aircraft didn't just fire on them. Although this question didn't linger very long, as heavy artillery turned every defended position into a bunch of craters deep enough to sink one of their own ships. And with that, it's the end of the Columbra front lines. In fact, at that point, they had destroyed not only the front line, but the second line, and most of the third. The Flyboys could simply clean up the rest. With this, the human forces use their vehicles to head out and retake the city that's been under siege since the invasion actually began. Reaching the outskirts of the gutted city, the human forces were actually surprised to see other humans simply standing on the edge of the city, just waiting as they stood over the bodies piled of Columbra. As the humans approach the pile of snakes, it is clear to see that the city, or more an extension of the planet, lived up to its reputation. As it turned out, the sign that Tegumbra passed was not a welcome sign to the city, but instead it was a sign welcoming those to the planet of Sparta. The name was decided on when those colonized it decided to live a new life with old standards. The standards include mandatory combat training with and without weapons, survival training so they can live on this world no matter what, vehicle training, communications, and even many of the so-called soft skills such as construction, economics, cybernetics, plumbing, all the way to home economics for every single person. All this coalesced into a prideful but extremely functional society. The unity of the people behind these ideals made them very difficult to break even at the worst of times. It was no wonder that even the youngest were able to defend their planet. As the human reinforcements walked up to the Spartans standing there, they noticed that those Spartans were still dripping Columbra blood. The human captain said as he looked at the carnage, We've come to rescue you. The oldest one standing there looked at him sideways and said, We don't need rescuing, but resupply would be nice. With that, the Spartan pulled a titanium rod that turned out to be a spear out of a dead Columbra. When he did, the splash of fluids that seemed to come out of the snake's body seemed to bother the reinforcements, but didn't affect the Spartans in the slightest. True to their word, the locals were very appreciative of the medical ships that seemed to be landing four, five, six, twelve at a time inside the cities from doorways underneath the rubble. Machines strained to push the rubble aside before exposing the massive underground structures to the fresh air. The young kids inside are hesitant to go outside at first, yet they were not the priority. The wounded are brought to the medics with great care, and thousands of injured are brought in priority first. While this is going on, the planetary governor is put on a holographic call with the general. The general states, I'm sending as many medical personnel to your location as possible. 
the governor responds, That is appreciated greatly by my people, sir. Is there anything else that you require? The governor thinks for a moment. Require? No. However, I do request that teams be deployed to farms and villages that were caught up in the invasion corridor. Without skipping a beat, the major in charge chimes in. Sir, we've already sent teams to the verify survivors. Unfortunately, it's not looking good thus far. The governor states, Excellent that you've sent them out, thank you. Then I only have one more request. He turns to the major before speaking. Could a few of your heavy armored personnel aid us in getting the bunkers completely open? Our heavy equipment is down there. Waving his hand at one of the captains that's standing next to him, he simply replies, I'm on it. The general then chimes in. Is there anything else? The governor responds, No, sir. Once our wounded are tended, our equipment is free. The only thing we desire is schematics for those medical shuttles, um, if that is not too much. The general smiles a bit before responding. You will have it. Also, be advised, we cannot remain on your planet for long. By our calculations, we will need 22 days to retrieve all personnel, equipment, and leave your system. I trust this will not be an issue. The governor chimes in and smirks a little. Not at all, sir. Ending the call, the governor turns toward the major before he leaves. The major pauses for a second and says, I just need to deliver a message to you from our ships in orbit. In particular, the ones that originally came to reinforce your fleet and got ambushed by the snakes. He reaches in and pulls a data pad out of his pocket to make sure he reads things straightfully. <clears throat> we would like to thank the coil gunners and the crews of your ground-based cannons. The snakes have found out that the giant human dick will easily penetrate them, making it hurt as much as possible as you tear their ass apart. As the Major puts the pad away, he's trying desperately to keep his professionalism as the governor immediately put his hand over his eyes and began to rub his forehead. Slightly grinning, he said, Your men's sense of humor really blows. The Major responds, Interesting choice of words.